Uh, my name is uh, Jeremiah Onyu. Uh, I'm a student at uh, IAC. I'm currently pursuing the Masters of Advanced Architecture. And um, we'll begin today's session with a keynote lecture on the theme integrating nature and culture with design. Um, for a bit of context, uh, modernity and development have long since been defined by systems that do not embody indigenous knowledge and the needs of our communities. And in this session, we begin to question the powers that have shaped our cities and discuss design as a tool for reparation. There's no better practice to speak about uh, this than CAVE uh, Bureau, a Nairobi-based uh, Bureau of Architects and researchers charting explorations into architecture, urbanism uh, and within nature. It was established in 2014 by uh, Kabage Karanja and Stella Mutegi. And their work addresses and works to decode both anthropological and geological contexts of the post-colonial African city, explored through drawings, storytelling, construction, and the curation of performative events of resistance. The Bureau is driven to develop systems and structures that improve human condition with a sensitivity to the natural environment and social fabric of our communities. By conducting playful and intensive research studies into caves within and out of Nairobi, they aim to navigate a return to the limitless curiosity of our early ancestors while confronting challenges of contemporary rural and urban living. The recent exhibitions of cave uh, work includes the Obsidian Rain, which was an installation at the 17th uh, International Architecture Exhibition at the Venice Biennale in 2021, and it was awarded a special mention among obviously other notable works. Kabagi is an architect and a natural environment enthusiast, uh, leading the geological and anthropological investigation into architecture and nature, while Stella is an architect as well, who leads the technical department while orchestrating uh, the seamless coordination of ideas into the built form. Today, we are honored to have them uh, share their project, the Cow Corridor Project, which kind of combines the ancestral heritage and contemporary architecture um, it's a proposal for the Maasai community to graze their cattle in Nairobi city. It's a true embodiment of who they are as a bureau. So um, allow me to introduce, to welcome uh, Kabage and Stella to share their work. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Zani. Um, allow us to just test our shared screen. Is that visible? Yes, it is. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much for inviting us. We'd like to thank IAC, ADC, um, and, and all entities and parties that have helped uh, bring this uh, symposium together, the African Ecological Architecture Symposium, of which we are excited to be keynote speakers of. It's great because they're obviously familiar faces in the room uh, who we've interacted with in, in varying ways. And great to see Zani and Jeremy uh, taking the helm of this, I think having met them at, in Rwanda. Um, so a big congratulations to the team for this, this really exciting event. Um, so the theme of the symposium is as titled, Integrating Nature and Culture and Design for which we hope to um, present our Anthropocene Museum project, both Stella and I. And fundamentally, uh, it, it touches on the fact that we are living in a city right now in Nairobi, which is very much epitomizing the subject, uh, looking at both nature and, and a sort of artificial urban landscape um, that share a similar boundary and similar edge of which multiple problems come up. And I think this picture encapsulates that um, being in Nairobi right now. Uh, this is a city that is uh, intersected by a national game park unique to, to Nairobi and actually the world in general. But before that. Yeah, we'll introduce ourselves um, as we were rightly introduced. Um, Kabagi and I started this firm 2014, and we don't work alone. We work with a team of um, architects and researchers. 
Um, and we've deliberately decided to keep the practice quite small, um, largely because we have both worked in very big architectural firms and we know the challenges of such. And so we, we decided to keep it small and it's been a wonderful experience having a small office and um, everyone knowing what they're supposed to be doing. There's been great synergy um, in that. So we, we don't plan to grow too big. Um, and, and so that we can keep our research, you know, um, within a few of us who are interested in doing the research and as well as practicing as, um, as architects, because apart from the research that we do, we are also wearing um, hard hats and walking around with measuring tapes and spirit levels on building, building sites and yelling at contractors and engineers. So we also do practice um, traditional architecture, as you'd call it. Yeah, and um, you know, we are architects that uh, are looking at so many other things uh, apart from the building. We are also looking at the past, we are looking at the present, we are looking at the future. And, you know, going through various different elements uh, borrowed from the past so that we can inform what, what the future holds for us, especially looking at it from a colonial um, perspective. And I think just to add, um, for the longest time, if you look at the colonial backdrop, I mean, we were referred to as savages, unlettered, ungodly, without much to contribute, except for extraction, exploitation. And I think that narrative in many respects is something we, we revisit quite critically and think about how then do we present and project ourselves, um, as Talat says, in the now and in the future. Um, and thinking about that in detail, we are called CAVE because we do venture into caves and uh, look at the histories embodied within those spaces as places of, of, of deep time heritage from a geological perspective and places that also more recently were used um, as spaces of resistance to hide where our freedom fighting for fathers and mothers would take refuge as they strategized ways to fight the colonial governments at the time. And I think it's not only caves, but within forests where we uh, reverted back into a space of deep thinking and critical address. And I think we also look further back to think about uh, the Plato's allegory of the cave and rethinking what it meant to leave the cave, um, philosophically speaking, and us thinking about a concerted return back into the cave um, with an African uh, vantage point to theoretically look at what it means to return back into the void of the cave, to rethink where we are a so-called civilization where we are practically in the road of destructing and decimating our earth systems. And we do that to really also begin imagining what that would mean to move away from that space. And these are works that we do to present uh, our histories of origin, how we've thought about it from different communities and ways we can begin to tell different stories but critically looking at architecture fundamentally as a history that needs retelling, rethinking and, and reprojecting in, in space and time to, to begin to frame a new dispensation of architectural production, which could sometimes even not involve building at all. The Anthropocene Museum is, um, say the research that encapsulate all that in one clean swoop. But if there are three words to take out of it is looking at the trauma that has been experienced, the colonial experience, and looking at how resistance has manifested over space and time, but now critically in a space where we need to look at healing uh, from a community level. And the museum does try to take that. But in that journey, we have great theoretical masters, even current and past, 
who have come before us to think deeply about what it might mean, such as Amitas Kosh, um, where he spoke in stating within the great derangement book, Climate Change and Unthinkable, that let us make no mistake, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. Um, Dr. Gabo Mate, trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. While Catherine Yusuf in her book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, the Anthropocene might seem to offer a dystopic future that laments the end of the world, but imperialism and ongoing settler colonialism have been ending worlds for as long as they have been in existence. And so within that, in the frame of thinking of the Anthropocene, we also look at the museum as a territory of investigation, uh, critically looking at the museums of, as having been part and parcel of the colonial project, and more so in terms of uh, a non-innocuous extractive uh, institution that operated on a global scale. Um, it is an institution that is kindly going through deep uh, rethinking and redress and our ability to begin to shape what uh, a museum of the future might look like is core to our research. Um, but fundamentally it's to state that the Anthropocene Museum is, is definitely in the, in the space uh, of geological time. We are in the Holocene epoch but an epoch that is proposed to have ended approximately in the 1950s um, and taking away uh, or being replaced by the Anthropocene. So it's a fixed time um, where man's uh, impact on the world uh, is felt in geological terms. And that is on a global scale in the entire biosphere from the sky um, to water systems to land and in predominantly a detrimental state with pollution at the heart of it. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's an age that has obviously been proposed without the mindset of the colonial uh, and imperial historical backdrop. And I guess our argument within this time scale of its beginning in 1950s is that it forgets that, for example, in Kenya, that very moment in the 1950s, at the sort of peak of modernism, um, civilization seemed to have just forgot that there were deep struggles um, to fight for independence within that time. And in Kenya, where we were in caves, trying to fight for that. So it's to really state uh, with as well the backdrop of authors such as Franz Fanon, um, among many others, Leslie Loco, and, and, and many thinkers is to rethink uh, this space and time geologically to think of what it means to be in the Anthropocene and who defines the Anthropocene and more so thinking about it with the colonial uh, backdrop. Where in Kenya specifically, uh, the British were deeply involved in um, uh, mass crimes against humanity of our people and we hid in forests uh, they set up concentration camps, um, such as these to the left. And we had freedom fighters who stood in the way of the so-called progress and extractive uh, modality. To the right at the top, um, Field Marshal Modoni, who was at the heart of the struggle, who was referred to by Deden Kemadi to the left, who passed on and was killed. She was referred to as a weaver, but because of her conception of of unique strategies against uh, the settler governments. And she was one of the last to leave the forests and the cave territories and uh, uh, very much a hero for us. And so that is why we go back to the caves, uh, critically thinking as well of artists who think about these themes like Osmond Masharia, these particular artworks uh, referred to as the wives of the Mau Mau because women and children were also involved in the struggle. And again, our own works internally that we, we look to rethink and project who we were and who we are now and who we can be in the future. 
And so how do we address all these things that um, Kabage is talking about? Um, we've done it through a series of um, visits to different caves around, around Kenya. And within those caves, we, we look at um, the communities living within or around the caves, what these caves mean to them, and what, what um, issues they may have regarding these caves and how we can come up as a voice um, for the communities to, um, to different agencies, uh, government, humanitarians, um, yeah, different people. So we come in and talk to these people and try and connect them so that these issues are addressed. And so our first one, we call it Anthropocene 1.0, um, is from the caves at um, Bai. And the image you see here um, is a crater at Susu. Susu is in the Rift Valley of Kenya and it's about 50 kilometers. Um, no, line about um yeah about 80 80 kilometers from nairobi and within that area the government is um extracting geothermal um, energy and one of the issues that the community has there is that um people get displaced because the government comes in and they find that they can explore and um get geothermal energy from these areas but these are ancestral lands and they have to move these people away. So that is one thing. And then the other one is um, as we try and get this green energy, there's a lot of destruction that happens to the plant species, to animal species, um, species that used to be there that are no longer seen. We have a guide that takes us around Suswa and he grew up there, born there, and he's grown up there um, all his life. And there's animals or birds that he would see uh, as a little boy that he no longer sees and has no idea what happened to them. But that's one of the effects of, um, of the geothermal exploration by the government. And around Suswa, we also have the baboons. We have a baboon parliament uh, within Suswa, but it's also under threat because Suswa is a place that um, the government is looking at, um, at exploring and extracting the geothermal power. So the image you see on your extreme left um, was at the Cooper Hewitt and Smithsonian uh, Design Museum where we got to exhibit some of the work. This was our first international exhibition. Um, and what we did was, and what we do with all caves that we visit anyway, we 3D scan them. Um, we do drawings from those 3D scans, uh, create models of the caves and uh, cast them in bronze. Uh, in addition, we also put drawings on, um, on leather hides um, as a way of also just protesting, you know, what is, what is going on um, with, with all these uh, communities and what it represents for them or what it means for them. Um, you know, for example, in Suswai, the geothermal exploration. Then we have, um, we'll play a video, uh, but I'll talk as you watch it. We also have performative arts um, within these spaces, within the caves, where we look at um, the past and in the future. So as you can see, the lady um, to the extreme right, was a little girl when the Mau Mau Stella, we actually, sorry to interrupt you. We don't see the video, I think. Oh, really? Have to... oh. <laughs> Let me try and share again. Do you see it? Yes, I see it still right now. Do you see a video? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, so the lady in black was a little girl um, during the, the struggle um, for independence and she would take food 
to the freedom fighters within the forest. And then now we have the little boy who is living after independence was gained. And we have an artist, Jackie Karitu, who um, is passionate about um, what is happening. And so we bring these people and we have performative um, acts talk about what it meant for this lady um, when she was a little girl, what it means for the little boy now living in a free Kenya, so to say. And um, yeah, as I was explaining earlier, these are the sort of drawings um, that we do from the 3D scans that we get. And these are the models that we make. And these models have, we have had the privilege of taking them around the world and you know, discussing some of these issues that we are quite passionate about and would like um, to give a voice to, to some of the issues that colonialism has been to many people and what um, some governments, especially in the global south, are not aware that they're still sort of colonializing their own people. So giving a voice um, to, to the people, so to say. Um, then we also revert back, obviously, to architecture. We are architects after all, um, looking at the caves and looking at architecture um, from the West and looking at how nature um, and built up forms actually um, compare. And we see that a lot of buildings borrow a lot from nature. It was quite interesting to find that this baboon cave, the, the shape of it, the size of it was uh, very similar um, in scale and size to the Rome Pantheon. And so nature becomes something that is a great reference for, for us as architects. Um, then also going down to um, Shimoni Caves. Shimoni Caves are on the east coast of Kenya in a place called Kwale. Um, and these were slave caves. They were slave holding caves. Um, people would be captured from the interior, brought down to the coast, held in these caves as they waited for ships to come down um, from 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 Zanzibar or on their way to Zanzibar. So all along the coast, they would come collecting um, the slaves who would then end up in Zanzibar. Zanzibar was the largest slave market. And then from there, they were bought by people that owned the, spl the spice plantations within Zanzibar and others were shipped uh, to the Middle East. So this is um, something also would like known because so much is talked about the West African slave trade. And we know a lot of where those slaves ended up, but very little is documented, very little is known about the East African uh, slave trade. And one could ask the question, what happened? What happened to these um, people? And for us who've been left um, generations from these people, we would like to you know, speak about them and um, let them be known that you know, they existed. And it's good for the world to know that this happened. So this is an image of the caves where they were held. Uh, they are very small. And to imagine the number of people that were cramped in these spaces. And when you go to the Shimoni caves, you'll find some of the chains on the walls. Um, of these caves. And so what we do is um, sit down with the community. Again, that is something very important to us, sit with the communities, um, speak with them about what these caves mean to them and what they see the caves as in the, in the future. And it was interesting. In Shimoni Caves, we came across different um, different views of what the caves meant or what the caves mean to them. We have a faction of people who believe that there was no slave trade. And there's a huge um, group as well that believes this slave trade. Obviously, the ones who deny that there was slave trade, despite all the um, evidence that there is, um, obviously those who are families that, that uh, were involved with the trade. But also there's um, a large group of people that are within, living within these caves that don't have a place to call home because at the time the British came, 
um, to stop slave trade. There were slaves from all over and then it was stopped and these people were never able to go home. So they're not even viewed necessarily as Kenyans because there's a lot of, um, of documents that they need to show which they don't have. And um, so there's a sort of lost generation of, of people. So those are issues we also address and want to bring to stakeholders so they know how to, to help these people. Yeah, and just looking again at the drawings that we do. Um, and while we were there, we came across um, information that there was tunnels. There was a tunnel that um, was about four kilometers or is about four kilometers um, long. And it was an escape route for some of the slaves who were fortunate enough to be able to break the chains and um, run, run away. And they would end up to another series of caves called the Three Giant Sister Caves, four kilometers away. And from there, they would find refuge. So it was interesting to us to find, you know, a cave of oppression and not so far away, a cave of refuge. So one of the things we plan to do um, in the near future is um, excavate that, that um, tunnel because obviously over the years it's silted and it's sealed. So it's to um, explore that tunnel, um, remove all the silt and see what other history um, is hidden in there and what it could inform us um, about the future of the people that live around there. And then lastly, as was mentioned, Obsidian Rain, which is Anthropocene 3.0. We had a great opportunity to, to curate this at the Venice Biennale. So, oh no, this is, sorry, I've jumped <laughs> ahead of myself. 3.0 was the Mbai Caves. The Mbai Caves are, um, are, are um, about 12, 10, 10 kilometers from the city center um, of Nairobi. And there were a significant set of caves because this was caves where the Mau Mau actually sat and, and um, strategized to fight for the freedom of Kenyans. And so what we did is 3D scan um, the caves and we collected obsidian rain from a place called Gilgil and Naivasha. And with those um, obsidian rocks, we created the shape of a section of the of the of the cave and hung that in in Venice. And the idea had been that uh, we would sit under this cave um, and discuss some of the issues. So unfortunately, we were not able to do that, obviously, because of COVID. But it was um, a good way to sort of um, remember the, the people who fought for our freedom and take a section of the space in which they sat in and transpose it in, in Venice for people to, to see and to hear and to remember them and to um, be aware that um, a lot of atrocities were, 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 were done to the people of Kenya. People sacrificed their lives and yeah, uh, and, and talk about it so that we have a view of what the, the future could be while addressing those traumas. And um, in a way to conclude our, our talk is the Anthropocene 4.0, where we touch on the Masai Kau Corridor and where we state it's, it's imagining a new decolon decolonial infrastructure of healing. And I think for us, uh, at the heart of the project is to looking at ways to address real-time problems with our research. And um, animal husbandry and the rearing of animals has obviously been at the heart of the homo sapiens civilization, uh, species should I say, um, 10,000 years before the pyramids of Egypt. And it's evident across the world on cave walls, uh, rock art, and um, expressed in many ways. And it's something we very quickly forget because, because of industrialization, we have mechanized how we get our food. We've mechanized uh, that 
uh, that process to the extent that we're dislocated from really where we came from as people who would rear animals for, for consumption. And it was creatures that we took care of. It was a free range practice. And the unfortunate truth today in Nairobi is that it is evident, but in the worst way possible, where the Maasai people unfortunately have been only left to use reserve land from railways to road reserves. And obviously cows whizzing through traffic is, is a mainstay. We always see it every day. And it's not only unique to Nairobi, but very many African and maybe global South, actually global South countries. And it's in the news, it's, it's in evident in, 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 our, in many spaces. But again, as Stella highlighted, we speak to the communities who are affected by this practice and a practice that was at the heart of their, um, their, their livelihood for the longest time, for centuries. And Dokas here and Emily, we spoke to in their, uh, in their ranch, if you call it that, uh, on the outskirts of Nairobi. And they spoke of the challenges they faced over time challenges where they still rear their cattle, animals that they are really passionate about and care a lot for. But due to the pressures of climate change, it's, it's quite clear that um, it's very difficult for them to continue that. Government support is really limited. So in a way, we, we start to look at that practice uh, in time, and in terms of what we refer to as reverse futurism, and thinking of ways to um, construct and conjure new infrastructures and new networks and spaces that would actually afford a coexistence of these uh, lifestyles over time and history. And being able to consider with this map, for example, a sequence of understanding Nairobi in terms of the rivers, because it is referred to as the place of cool waters and Nairobi as a Maasai word a place where they would bring their animals, not only for grazing, but to get refreshment. But over time with the colonial project, the railway, the roads intersected the city. And uh, in reality, in between all that, are uh, green uh, spaces, the national park where the first slide we shared with the giraffe right in the middle is just there and the airport reserve land, railway reserve land, spaces that we believe can still be used by the Maasai to traverse through the city. Because um, unfortunately we use uh, colonial logics to create boundaries again, boundaries that are, have obviously resulted in a lot of subjugation of many, a lot of uh, constraint to the people and boundaries that can be rethought. And in a way, the city for us is a, is a space and, and a project to reconsider uh, what decolonialism can, can mean on a larger scale. And so this we presented last year for the DZ15 um, birthday, where they're celebrating the 15 years. And they called upon us and other designers to think about the next 15 years. And here is where we proposed for Nairobi that a cow corridor could be conceptualized and put into action. And um, this being a structure that was conceived using the geometry of the Shimoni slave cave, but flipped in reverse to act as a rainwater store and collection unit that obviously conjured a return uh, of the space, but flipped in a sort of parallel universe where the cave's roof was at the ground but because of the intention to actually collect rainwater. It allowed for a space of shade, a space where uh, rainwater can be collected, where the walls would be laced uh, with salt as a sort of hybrid uh, earthen, and a sort of earthen concrete structure by trying to minimize concrete in the equation, but also lacing it with salt because salt is critical for the cows to lick and it being an attractive space, not only for cows, but also for wild animals who have also experienced the pressures of climate change on a larger scale. And so it imag we imagined spaces beneath almost cave-like that allowed for huge pools of water and plant and bird life, animal life to live 
and where the Maasai could come. But I think that also transcended and expanded on the huge highway projects that have been put into place that will only increase traffic into the city. And so for us is to argue sections of these uh, expressways could be rethought to allow for wildlife to return back into the city. It is obviously a provocative uh, and, and you could argue a bit playful, but at the heart of it are serious propositions to think about a city uh, like any other in the world where cars are really the problem and building more roads to bring them in is never the right solution. And so how is all this funded? Um, it must be a very expensive venture. Uh, we created what we call BRIT. Uh, BRIT is the Benevolent Reparation Institute. And we've used it as a vehicle where um, reparation money can be put um, into this institute. And one of the reasons we, we created it is we thought about how much should be returned and who should it be returned to. Um, there's been figures varying from 100 to over 700 trillion US dollars um, from all that has been stolen, all the trauma that has happened on the global south. And so this institute would be a place where this money is put and then we would have um, in the different countries on the global south, a place where then um, projects like the Maasai Corridor uh, would have competitions and people would come and present an idea and would have a panel of um, thinkers and you know, creatives, environmentalists, all sorts of people, human rights activists, who would sit in that panel, uh, listen to all these presentations and see which one um, they think um, addresses a lot of the trauma um, and would bring healing to the people. So um, yeah, it's an institute where then a lot of people from around Africa, um, Asia, South America would be able to address um, all these issues that were brought about by colonialism and be able to come up with, with um, projects that would sort of heal or start a healing process for, for the future. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, hopefully in your corner of wherever you're from, you can start thinking of this sort of project um, that would heal. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stella and Kabage. I think this was like a very enlightening uh, presentation and like uh, quite an interesting story. Um, we really do appreciate your time and uh, giving us insights and things to think about when we are uh, moving forward and you know down the line setting up our offices and things to actually begin questioning. Um, we, we really do appreciate. Uh, because of time, uh, I had a few questions, but I think you have mostly answered all of them. I think one thing is, uh, maybe one thing I could bring up is the, anthrop the Anthropocene is uh, often discussed from a Western perspective. Um, what has been your experience on talking about it from an African perspective? And has the human, as well as the human impact on the environment on the continent uh, been positive? Would you regard it uh, in that way? Um, it's a good question. I think I only came across the word a few years ago and I was like, what, what in the world is this? And um, uh, a few uh, theorists, including Leslie Loco, sort of brought to it to our attention and the fact that it had a strong geological standpoint became a springboard for us to think about it. It's something we're only just thinking about um, in, in such a deep way and looking at how to present it in the African perspective. But more so as architects, you know, it's really tricky because we are perceived to deliver buildings as our core 
but buildings unfortunately are participating in in exacerbating the, the the age we live in in a detrimental way so i was thinking maybe architecturally uh, how do you extract the building element from that discourse from that discussion and i think for us that became a project to think about a museum without four walls and uh, stella said the museum has gone from different parts of the world uh, without any brick and mortar and we've exhibited our thoughts uh, conversations with communities highlighting the issues they're going through which at its core we feel a museum functions to do and uh, so in our own way we, we are trying to to define uh, this age in this time uh, but more so in a way to resist it it's not just to say this is what it is it's to resist it and think about way to solve the problems of, of the past yeah. perfect thank you uh there's a question from the audience as well um anthony wako um first thanks you for the presentation he says it's a very fantastic presentation and um he his question i think is regarding the the 2.0 uh, anthropocene and he says are the caves that were remnants of chains uh within or close to nairobi if yes uh then how were the slaves transported through the national park region um or were they transported via the southern route uh, in tanzania um they were transported by foot <laughs> from from the yeah. interior um yeah. and then taken to the coast so the Indian Ocean coast is where they ended up. And then from there, they were put on ships down to Zanzibar. Um, and then from Zanzibar, they were sold. Um, some remained in the plantations there and then others were mostly taken to, to the Middle East. So um, yeah, at that time, of course, I, I, they were from various countries, by the way, various countries. Um, that touched the, the coastline. So we have Kenya, we have Tanzania, we have Mozambique and going down that way, but they will all end up, um, they would all end up in Zanzibar. But sometimes there was collecting, like the, the Shimoni caves were holding caves. So we have people from, originally from Malawi, from Congo, from all over, who ended up there as they waited to be to be shipped so and that what that is what i was talking about earlier about people who almost have no identity because they they, they were uprooted from where they were and ended up for instance in kenya and when slave trade was abolished um yeah there was there was nowhere to go <laughs> yeah I, I hope i've answered your question yeah, mostly it was by foot. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much again. Um, the, it gives us so many things to think about uh, moving forward from, from this point. Thank you.